feel like an old southern woman in church. Hello internet, my name is James and you're watching Macabre Bandscape, the most ill-titled music-related channel on YouTube. Um, today we're doing a collection update. Uh, it's been a while. Buying new records it didn't really happen until very recently. So, there's actually a lot because I had a birthday, so I was gifted some stuff. Um, mostly money, uh, which I use for groceries and CDs. So that was fun. Um, and then I uh, went down to my local record shop and got a shit ton of stuff. None of that stuff will be in this video. That will be sometime down the line. I'm still waiting on a few things to come in. So once everything is collated, that will probably be my next collection update. So yeah. Um, let's get started. I have to be a little careful with my setup because everything is precariously balanced and placed. And the last thing I want to do is spill my wine. I don't remember what it's called. It's a Pinot Grigio, 2019. It's a, actually, Bella something. Uh, it is an Italian wine. It's really nice, crisp. Mm. Beautifully chilled. Okay. First things up, let's... Uh, I kind of went on a little bit of a crusade in terms of bands I feel like I should have been keeping up with or having, you know, known a lot more of their material, but for whatever reason, I had not uh, paid much attention or bothered to buy a lot of their stuff. Start off with Theater of Tragedy. And this was, uh, this is their last album, their seventh last and last album, 2009's uh, Forever is the World. This came out on AFM Records. And this specifically is a Mexican release uh, that has, it's the double disc, so it has the album and uh, an EP that came out the next year. I don't actually remember what the EP is called. It's uh, the Addenda EP. And I liked this a lot. Uh, according to the Wikipedia article about this album, there was like some loudness war going on with this one. So like peaking and clipping of the mic, uh, which I don't really hear at all. Um, and I've listened to this, you know, a few times. Not, you know, over and over and over again. I've not really had the time for that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I span it, spun it, span. I spun it quite a bit and it's it's good i really like it um it's just you know really strong gothic doom metal out uh, of gothic doom metal it brings a lot of those older sounds back from their old uh from their early days with Liv christine and because you know at, in the middle uh of their career they had gone kind of electro pop industrial with a little bit of heavy metal influence here and there but not a lot um in fact even the album before this though you could argue it's a gothic metal album, still has a lot of that electro-pop industrial sounds on it. This, not so much. It does show up, you know, here and there. It's supposed to kind of, like, as the last, you know, album, it is supposed to kind of have little tidbits of their whole career in it. And they kind of mirrored that in the release, which has aspects of every single album cover that they've ever released. So that's cool. Really pretty. This is a, yeah, again, a Mexican release uh, version released on Scarecrow Records. I love Scarecrow Records. If you, you know, find albums for sale, uh, Mexican presses from Scarecrow, go ahead and get them. I stand by them. I think they're really good. I've never had a bad experience. So there's that. Uh, another album in this kind of like trying to get to know bands that you know that you, well, I know that I've liked, that I've never really bothered to get into their, you know, stuff all that much, was Arch Enemy. And I know it's an unpopular opinion to say that you like Arch Enemy on certain sides of the internet. I like Arch Enemy, uh, specifically, unpopular opinion, I only like the stuff after John Leva left. I don't care for their first three albums. I don't care if they're classics. I just, his vocals are just so bad. I can't, I could probably come up with a word, amateurish, there. I won't say bad. Amateurish, I don't like how they sound. Uh, Angela Gosso actually sounds like she knows what she's doing. Uh, she was a great vocalist. And then uh, Alyssa White Gluz, I feel like was not the right choice for her generally but i do love her and i do love her work with the agonist so so much like so much but i think it was not the greatest fit for this band um but yeah so this is 2003's anthem of rebellion this is their second album that they did with angela and it is just a really solid melodic death metal album i mean no frills yeah no frills really um a little bit of keyboard here and there but you know other bands like dark tranquility have also done this this is just really catchy melodic it still hadn't lost that bite that they would eventually do like later down the line it still feels like ferocious and like vivacious and just uh, it's a, just a really fun time it is a good record um 
it is funny that we will rise uh got so popular I and mean, it was a single but i think the rest of the album like the really 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 good songs on this album of that group i think it is probably one of the weaker ones like just die, dead i see no future leader of the rats exist exit uh marching on dead end road i think it's been a hot minute so i'm blanking on which ones are instrumentals but this album was just so much fun to listen to and i yeah it was really cheap too i really liked this uh, this also came with two discs. I don't actually remember what the last... Oh, it's a live album, I think. Or DVD? It's a DVD. There's a bonus DVD. Um, yeah. Anyways, this is 2003 on Century Media, if I didn't say. Really cool. You know, Swedish melodic death metal. A lot of fun. Next up, let's do... This is a new release. This is Imperia's The Last Horizon. This is a Norwegian, Dutch, German, Belgian finish. They've had members mostly from a lot of northern european uh countries this band started with uh was started by helena Eden mikkelsen of angel she was also an angel uh or is angel really she's that's a, basically a one person project i talked about angel in a previous video recently so this is the her main band with you know a handful of other people they do symphonic metal, started off in that like gothic symphonic early 2000s kind of place. She herself came from Trail of Tears, which I've recently reformed, so keep an eye out for them. And this is their sixth release, I believe, and it was actually the quickest turnaround of all their career. Uh, their last album came out in 2019, and this was a 2021 20, release. Super fast. Um, it's a double album, though I don't truly understand why it's a double album. Uh, all the music on this album fits on one disc. Uh, it's an hour 12, 13-ish. I don't quite understand why it is two albums, but I'm not complaining. I think it's it, it's a good spin. It's just, you know, kind of folky, leaning, dramatic, symphonic. The only problem that I have, you know, the only problem that I have is this trend with a lot of modern symphonic metal, where it tends to be a lot of... The, the orchestration is really big, but kind of for the sake of being really big, I feel like sometimes these bands need to, like have someone there to pull them back a little bit um it can just be a little bit too much and they all end up sounding you know all the orchestration parts just kind of end up sounding the same uh which is a shame uh so yeah it, it's a good it's a good record honestly but uh so far not my favorite by them but really good uh there's some great lyric work you know on this album a lot better than some of their other stuff yeah this is good next up is another dutch band uh, i think did i ever talk about them on this channel i don't remember this is autumn i yeah i did i played one of their albums in the background my first video no you yes first uh they were a dutch gothic metal band in the same vein as like uh annika you know late mid hmm? annika era the gathering and within temptation uh early within temptation so like beating the beast a little bit let's why are you auto correcting so violently oh this is gonna bother me in post so much anyways I'm sorry. <laughs> this is their uh, fourth album, Altitudes, 2009, released on Metal Blade Records. This was their first album after their first lead singer left and was replaced by whoever sang on this one. Um, it's a d different style. Um, their early stuff was gothic metal. This is more like alternative rock with some like, their alternative atmospheric rock with some of their like gothic metal, like, tendencies peeking through and for the most part a lot of these songs work i think the first three songs are like phenomenal material after that there is not a steep decline but it definitely ends on like not the best note um it's good it's just you know it's only good i was hoping it would blow me away because it honestly gets pretty well reviewed even on the metal archives but i don't know i thought it was good and then the other album I got from them was on the same vendor on Discogs, I think. Yeah, uh, and that is their most recent album, 2019's. Holy shit, it's been two years. Um, I meant to get this a lot sooner. Uh, their sixth album, Stacking Smoke, it had been about eight years since their last release. <clears throat> and to be, truth be told, I haven't actually spun this yet, uh, but I do know that for the most part, aesthetically and sonically they have not changed since they first changed their sound in 2007 so that's when they dropped off of the gothic metal committing to that sound was their third album and they haven't really changed style 
uh, as, you know, since then. They've been doing something pretty similar. So, you know, I'm hoping that this blows me away. Because <clears throat> I know that their 2007 album, when I was like, I was writing um, quantitative analysis papers in the library in college, and <clears throat> I'd have that album in the background on, uh, you know, playing my headphones. And that album was really good. And I want to get it. And actually, I think I have it in my cart in one of, you know, eBay or Discogs or somewhere. Um, but I, I will get it. Uh, this one, I hope, does blow me away. I know that their one before this, 2011, 2011's Cold Comfort, got kind of mixed reviews, which is odd for this band, at least in this era. But yeah, um, this was released on Painted Bass Records. I'm actually, you know, I actually need to listen to this. So no more comment on that one. That's nice. Okay. Next, I have something a little different. <clears throat> that is Factory of Dreams. This is a... Holy shit, I don't actually know. I think it's a two-person project. It's the instrumental... Instrument, it's the instrumentalist uh, and the singer. And I believe the instrumentalist is Portuguese and the singer is Swedish. Um, I believe, again, this is kind of... Um, I don't really remember. This is a progressive atmospheric kind of metal project. Super spacey. Um, and I know that there's a reason why I had this in my want list for a long time. Like this was sitting in my want list for years. And I know that there was a reason why, but I haven't been able to like sit through this whole album since I got it. It's just very, uh, you can see them there. Uh, just spacey, atmospheric progressive metal kind of like a electronic sounding synth like synth heavy um the vocal melodies are kind of plain the singer doesn't have like an amazing voice he's just kind of there to deliver like speech level singing um kind of high pitched uh yeah not much to say about this one i actually have to listen to this one all the way through too um but yeah so this was released 2008 on prog rocks records and you're, if you're interested um honestly I wish I had more to say about it, but I was just not super into it. And hopefully it will hit me better later. And let's see. Haha, -ha. White Crow by La Ventura. <clears throat> so La Ventura is this Dutch uh, gothic metal band. Yeah, Dutch. Uh, they released their first album independently. That's called A New Beginning. Uh, and then it was repressed through Renaissance Records. And then there was like a six year period in between before they finally dropped their sophomore record, White Crow. And this is a very simple, um, <clears throat> just, you know, pretty short, commercially viable, easily digestible uh, gothic metal, kind of new metal-ish, you know, down-tuned guitars, very just, you know, traditional first chorus. It is just a good time. Um, I think... Overall, the band did, you know, improve in style between their debut and this. Uh, pretty, you know, by a wide margin. Uh, their debut, I think, is just kind of good. Uh, and this is actually pretty fucking good. <laughs> uh, not a great distinction there, but in my head, there is, um, there's a point system in my head. Uh, and I'm not going to get into it. But yeah, so pretty simple. I think this is actually just under 40 minutes. 10 tracks. Very blue. This is a repressing of their album through Ravenheart Music Records, whatever it's called. And yeah, just really good, just modern, gothic, new metal-ish. It's kind of like what Darkwell was doing with their Metatron album, but like, successful. Shots fired. Um, <laughs> That's all I have to say about that one. And this next one is an American band. Holy shit, an American band that I actually listened to. And that is Grave Shadow. And Grave Shadow is a band that I started listening to before they released their debut album. They put out an EP, I believe, in 2014. And in early 2015, I purchased it off of their website. And that, of course, is, is now Lost of Time. Unfortunate. I That was actually something that I would have liked to be able to like buy back. But the band wasn't selling at the time. Uh, when I <laughs> checked e like Discogs and eBay, that it's not available. Which is a shame. So they had a self-titled EP before uh, getting signed to, I think, Mausoleum Records, uh, and then releasing their debut album, which I'm blanking on the name of, but it is really good. And then they released this one through M-Theory and Salem Rose Music. 
And this is basically just a continuation of that album, just a little bit tighter and better sound quality. Um, it's so cool. I love this band. It's symphonic metal, but it's not like, you know how the Imperia, I said, had some issues with like the orchestration just being a little bit too overbearing. Not even necessarily like too upfront in the mix, um, because honestly, I think symphonic metal in the modern day has gotten better at balancing out and making that like guitar tone fucking punch through. Sometimes just it is a bit much, but the orchestrations kind of become muddled and not uh, super well executed. This band, from what I can tell, has no issue with that because it is all just uh, keyboards and synths and stuff still. Very early 2000s, I think, stylistically, if I were just going to like point at a band from the early 2000s and be like, they're most like that. It would probably be Lunatica, specifically on their Fables and Dreams album. But honestly, this hits a little bit more uh, traditional heavy metal beats. And there's also harsh vocals on it because the lead singer does both clean and harsh vocals. And she is very good. Um, yeah, very good, actually. I, yeah, great voice. Uh, I believe she has since left the band. I think they broke up for a year and she has since left. Uh, and, you know, I hope I see her around sometime doing more music because this was fucking cool. Um, but yeah, just really fun, heavy Modern Symphonic Metal from the U.S., of all things. Okay, next up is another band, speaking of Symphonic Metal, that is Visions of Atlantis. I have mentioned this band before. This is an Austrian Symphonic Power Metal band. And do you ever have a band that you maybe started buying their stuff, like, way down the line, and then you remember that you saw them live? <laughs> I saw Visions of Atlantis live, and I always forget that, and it was in Belgium at the Metal Female Voices Fest uh, day three, as a, the third day only, and they were the second headliner, so they were right before Therion. And this is actually the year that I saw them. This came out in 2011. This is Napalm Records, by the way. I <laughs> saw them. I completely forgot. I think I sat that set out. Like I was just like, no. I'm going to go in the back and sit on the stairs because I have no interest in this band. And I, that is how I felt about them for years. In fact, I still stare at them and often go, you fucking low-rent Nightwish clones. Um, but yeah, no, this was an album uh, that I had no interest in. I tried listening to it, did not go my way. Uh, until recently, I got into them a bit more, loved their debut. Their second album was pure candy, like not engaged, like... Not not engaging, but not challenging, not, like, extreme at all. But they did eventually win me over with their debut and their second album. Their third album I thought was just kind of whatever. Um, but this one, their fourth album, I actively despised for years. <laughs> and I kind of regret it. But at the same time, I also feel like I shouldn't because, like, it, it, uh, even listening to this now at the beginning was a little challenging. I had to give myself over to this record. It's uh, it's just the problem with this specific era of the band was that the two singers had inflexible, blunt voices. And it's supposed to be like a duet band. There are two singers, and they're supposed to work. And they do not. First of all, uh, the guy singer, who I don't remember his name, is just not very good. He's uh, like he got, He's gotten better at his craft. He's just not particularly great. Um, and then the female singer that they had at the time, who they hired from Elysian, Elysian? Bare Infinity. I don't remember which band she was in, but um, she also kind of had this like weird thing about her voice. First of all, not mixing with anyone. I've heard her sing other duets. It just does not work. Um, she should not do that anymore. Um, but yeah, and they also try to put her in a more classical kind of sounding, like, register, like, a little bit more floaty in the head. And she can't really do that. She can't pull that off. She is a belter through and through. And the songs where she gets to just, like, belt it out in her chest and just be that lower range singer that she is, that's when she really fucking shines. But it doesn't happen very often on this record. So I think the problem with this is um, the singers mostly. They don't go well together. Um, and honestly, the just the... the, the vocal arrangements don't blend well period um but yeah mostly it's the vocals that kill this album uh in general the songwriting is actually pretty fucking cool i don't like 
modern timestamps on like fantasy based bands like they're called visions of atlantis why do you have a lyric about the television it's weird i don't know i'm sorry that's just a little gripe that i have but yeah so i actually saw this band with this lineup so that was interesting um good festival i really you know rip i think maybe they brought it back i don't remember but um yeah good festival i enjoyed myself uh I sat on the stairs for this one. Uh, yeah. Anyways, next up is something a little different. Uh, something that would not probably be related to my taste. And to some extent, I'd argue that it really isn't. But I found this band back in those days when full metal albums were starting to be able to like be viewed and uploaded to YouTube. And they were very popular in around 2013. And this band had albums... Uh, before, you know, companies would come in and block them in certain places. I would see this band often, and I would listen to it. And that is Siebenbergen. This is a Swedish, I believe, uh, melodic death. Nope, wrong. Melodic black metal um, band. And kind of melodic gothic black metal. You know, that kind of like Venn diagram of where melodic black metal meets gothic metal. Uh, this is honestly a bit drier than their later stuff which actually brings in a lot more of those gothic elements this band started off in that like they had that female uh operatic backing vocal kind of like cradle of filth but they were a lot less keyboard heavy a lot less gothy a lot less symphonic and it was mostly just there to supply like these uh folky vocal melodies which i honestly i thought they worked pretty well um this album is a lot drier they um honestly i don't really understand the term war metal but if i was going to say that there was a watered down version of war metal i think this would be it uh just with a bit more of a like grandiose kind of majestic feel to it uh there are the female vocals on this i believe they got the vocalist from ooh, i don't remember what that band was called it was a uh, doom metal band from i think sweden it was a swedish band and yeah just look at them <laughs> it's so weird just opening a booklet and seeing corpse paint. I'm not used to that. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of black metal in my collection. And the, the black metal that I do listen to usually doesn't do the corpse paint thing, so that was weird. Um, there's the disc. It's again during that time in the 90s when there was just like a tits out thing going on. But yeah, so that's that album. I don't love it. There are some songs that do hit really well and others that I just am bored while listening to. Uh, and I don't want to go through them and tell you which ones are which. Just know that some of the songs slap. They slap their bangers. Um, bops, maybe even. Uh, but the rest is just kind of like whatever. And also by this band is Darker Designs and Images. This is their 2005... Let's see. So this was, I think, their fourth album. Fifth album. Yeah. So this is 2005. 2001, 2005... Their 2005 uh, fifth album, this is, uh, both of these are Mexican presses. Again, Mexican presses, Scarecrow Records. And this is the actually an album that I'd never heard anything off of. Uh, I just never bothered investigating this album at all. And I am kicking myself now because this album is fucking great. It is gothic black metal just done right. I read this review on the Metal Cribes once that just said it just, that genre combination doesn't work. I think this fucking does. Also, I think a lot of Curdo Filth stuff does but that, that's neither here nor there and opera nine maybe this does it very nicely none of the songs overstay their welcome uh for black metal they keep them relatively short and it's just really nice melodic catchy gothic black metal uh yeah i actually really enjoyed this a lot i think the production leaves some stuff to be desired but in general it's great i thoroughly enjoy listening to this album check it out uh, and then we come into a band that got mentioned in a recent Marty Worm stream. Actually, as of recording this now, that stream happened last night, I think. Thinking is hard. And that band is Dark Tranquility. This is actually my first Dark Tranquility album. This is their 2002 record, uh, Damage Done. This is a digipack release under Scarecrow. Again, Mexican pressing. Solid digipack. I love that. This trifold. I love me a trifold. Um, but yeah, this was just really aggressive. Again, with the like as I mentioned with the Arch Enemy album, 
this still has that bite that you know that punch that aggression that i think a lot of these bands ended up losing a little bit just as production got cleaner um with time but yeah i don't know what to say about it it's my first dark tranquility album i've listened to them for a few years now i got into melodic death metal like i jumped right into it in around 2018 i think and yeah i listened to all those like early dark tranquility in flames um or, i mean some smaller bands i'm blanking on their names but yeah i just jumped in and i found something that i like and then i purchased this one kind of on a whim and i think it's fucking great i originally i originally heard monochromatic stains through uh the agonist who did a cover of it for their like century media 20th anniversary 30th anniversary thing and i really liked that um and it the original also sounds fucking great i think both versions are phenomenal but yeah just really cool swedish gothenburg Melodic death metal. Cool, cool. We're coming towards the end, I believe. Two more things. No, three more things. First is Darzimat. This is their second album, Oniriad. Came out in 2003. Again, Scarecrow Records version. Spanish pressing. Nope, Mexican pressing. Uh, unfortunately, the tray came off. I have no glue dots here. I thought I did, but I can't find my glue dots, so I can't re-adhere this to the tray unfortunate so i'm just gonna have to wait until i get some glue dots so darzamat let me back up darzamat is an interesting band they've had an interesting not mm, well how about this in the late 90s mid 90s 1996 they debuted with their debut album i'm blanking on the name it has a long name and it was a melodic black metal album they did a follow-up ep to that in in 2000 i think in 2000 they did a follow-up ep that was also melodic black metal fast forward three albums or three years uh they get signed to who the fuck knows what record label this was and they put out this gothic metal album <laughs> and now the guy who used to do the screaming is doing the singing and the thing is he's not in the case of uh who is it the guy from opeth and the guy from catatonia that just can't do growls anymore he still can after this album they went back to black metal i'm pretty sure if not directly after this album, the next one after, they went back to black metal. And he's still doing harsh vocals. I don't know what was going on in this with this band at this point in time where they decided to just become like another Polish gothic metal band. Um, to be fair, they also did it very well. Um, unfortunately, the guy is not a great singer. Uh, oftentimes, he is slightly off key or off tune, off note. Just his intonation isn't great. But i think in general the songwriting is spectacular it's pure cheese this is pure cheese it is dramatic and like just dripping and like synthetic keyboard atmosphere it's great there's this one song time which i think is fucking great and it is like it has the base of it is just like this like electro goth beat it's so fucking good <clears throat> and yeah i just i just enjoy this album so much and i wasn't expecting to enjoy it so much it's just really fun um beauty is which is the fourth song is like just a jazzy like bluesy kind of slow number sensual as shit <laughs> it's just this this album was a fun ride for me i think it's fucking great and if you don't like it you're wrong <laughs> you just have no taste um because what's that quote by like john waters there's good bad taste and there's bad bad taste to have good bad taste one must have good very good taste and that's how I feel about this. Uh, this is just pure camp, gothic, melodrama. Wonderful. Cheese, cheese, cheese. Only cheese. Uh, next up is Stormlord, The Gordon Cult. This is their third album, I believe, released in 2004, originally on Scarlet Records. Again, Mexican pressing. I love me some Mexican pressings. That is just, I am a broken record this episode. Um, but yeah, this is a, this is a symphonic black metal. It's light, I believe. Hmm? Is that this band? I'm just going to go ahead and just say symphonic black metal. I don't remember if this band has power metal influences on it the same way that Kalma does. I'm, I am I can't tell. But this is just symphonic black metal. And I haven't listened that much to this record uh, or listened to this that much of this record. That's the word I'm looking for. I haven't listened that much to this album. But the few songs I have heard, I think are great. Um, for the most of this is an Italian band. I believe they started off playing death metal. 
Uh, what I really want is their first two albums. But this was for sale by a vendor I like on eBay, I think. No, this, mm, yeah, eBay. And I decided to just pounce on it. Uh, so for black metal, from what I can tell, the band in general is not sketch. Unfortunately, I did some research into one of the guest singers, and he's kind of sketch. So that was a bummer. That kind of bummed me out. Um, but in general, I don't think this band, you know, really prescribes all that nonsense, at least not vocally. So who knows? Uh, they could be crazy Italian right wingers. I don't know. But this was just, in general, a lot of fun. Uh, from what I've heard, they're, they're, I still need to listen to this all the way through, though. Um, yeah, just really big sounding symphonic black metal. And the last thing, it's really two things I have. Um, <laughs> this was probably my most anticipated release of 2020 and then 2021 when it got pushed back. And that is The Bitter Truth by Evanescence. This album is almost 10 years in the making. Well, not really. It is two years in the making. But the fans have been anticipating since like 2012. So, and well, realistically 2015, because that's when they came out of hiatus. First of all, I must show off my mint tin. Uh, this I got over the summer. It had some mints to go with the album cover. Yeah, and I'll just keep it forever. So I actually have two versions of this album. One is the original Digipack that came with the box. My box set. That's the Digipack that came with the box. Two discs. It's the album and a live set that they did uh, virtually. And then this is the Target edition with bonus tracks. Let's see. I guess I should describe the sound. So let me put it this way. It's all over the place. Um, some of it is, uh, it's like electronic, hard rock, alternative metal. And I've had my, you know, coming to terms with this album and really coming to terms with every Evanescence album is an emotional journey for me. <laughs> um, let me just talk about the photography. It's so pretty. Just because I feel like I love this band so much that every single time they drop an album, I my, my gut instinct is to be disappointed. Um, but yeah, I actually really like this a lot. <laughs> I will say, however, though, because they did release four out, uh, singles last year in anticipation of this release, when the songs, well, when there's only like a dozen tracks, when there's only a dozen tracks on the album, it does kind of feel like you've been gifted, like, or you've received part of an album. Like, it's not complete because some of it isn't new anymore. Like, uh, Wasted on You was released a year before the release of the album. And so, like, when you've had that long period of time to sit with these songs, they don't feel new anymore. So it kind of feels like you, maybe you got a little shortchanged. But it's a really good album. I, I stand by it. I wish that there were strings on it, a lot more strings on it. They've only show up on the last three songs, which I think is a wasted opportunity. Uh, my personal opinion on this band is, even though I do tend to love every release that they do, is that uh, they should, first of all, get a different producer. I, I think the production on this album... Yeah. The mix specifically is just kind of all over the place. Uh, don't love the mix. Uh, other than that, it's the American production, like producers in the US when you're working with like this, like so big of a band, they don't really know what to do with a band like Evanescence. I think they should go to Europe and have some Europeans work with them because they will at least know what to do. Um, they need to have someone point them in a direction and go like, just commit to whatever you're going to do, commit to it. Just go all the way. Don't half-ass it. Go all the way. Like, if they want to do strings on a song, put fucking strings on a song. If they want to do electronic, go fucking electronic. If you want to mix all of it, mix all of it and go hard. And I think that's the one thing about this band that over the years has started to, like, bother me a bit. Is just, like, Americans don't know how to deal with a band like this. But yeah, I, I still really enjoy this album. So far, of the new releases that I've bothered listening to, it is still the top one. Um, and in this box, because I feel like I should show off the box. Again, look at that. They included a cassette tape with one side is the Evolutions, which is basically just uh, little tidbits of songs and how they progressed. And then the other side is instrumentals for six, I believe, of the songs. 
fun stuff. And then we have a little poster card for the Use My Voice promotion, which was cool, which was a voting song. They released a song to promote voting. Um, and The Bitter Truth, it's a journal. I don't know if you'd be able to see that, but it's embossed sort of. Um, and also the photography, love Tim. Loved him so much. Um, then there's Troy. I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna go through all the band members. Um, Amy, Jen, Will. I'm not gonna show you them. But there is like a letter to the fans at the beginning. Some photography, the lyrics to the songs, handwritten, and then there's uh, blank pages so that you can write your own stuff. And then there's also sheet music. Piano and vocals, I think. Yeah. Oh, so good. Far From Heaven. And then there's also blank sheet music so that you can write your own stuff. And I probably won't use it because I am bad at like physically writing out sheet music. I have an app for that on my phone, <laughs> which I also released a recording that I did from that app. It's unlisted on my channel, but it, it's there. Uh, I might think about making it public, but yeah. <clears throat> That's what I have. Thanks for watching. Um, put in the comments what band you forgot that you saw live and whether or not you like them now. Trying to up that engagement. Call to action. Subscribe. Like. Smash that like button. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time.